This week's devotionals was amazing. Thank you, Melissa, Alan, Joe, Sheila, Erica. It was incredible. I, I, I'm so blessed every time by hearing how you guys are able to not only add some of your own life experience, but really dissect the word for us in an incredible way. Um, so thank you so much. If you missed it, remember to catch up with it. We're busy with a series where we're teaching through the book of Philippians. Uh, if this is your first time here, or you haven't been around, um, we're on the, in the process, right? We started with chapter one. We spoke about transcendent knowing, the fact that we're able to see better, and the better we see, the more confidence we will have, right? So if you can't see, you don't have confidence. We spoke about that week one. Week two was about a transcendent humility. Uh, we spoke about the fact that there's an identity that God brings for us, right? So Philippians chapter two, we spoke through that, transcendent humility, and then this week, we're going to speak about transcendent value. But quickly before I do that, next week, we're speaking about chapter 4 in Philippians, and we're going to speak through transcendent peace. And if, if you've ever been in a situation where something that happened around you stole your peace, okay, is it just me? Okay, so th life happens, and suddenly we don't have peace. And, and next week, we're, we're going to speak about how to live a life that doesn't go up and down due to circumstances, but how to live in the fullness of God. This week, however, we're speaking about a transcendent value. So Isaac Newton famously said, what goes up must come down, right? Anybody ever read that? What goes up must come down. It's a principle. And in fact, it's the principle that um, I believe Philippians chapter 3 is written about. Okay, and if you're confused, that's good. It'll help you listen to me for the next couple of minutes, okay? <laughs> what goes up must come down. Two questions I want to ask you today. Question number one, should we? Question number two, do we? Okay, what goes up must come down. Should we and do we go up and down? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. It's the very end of the chapter. I'm going to teach through the entire chapter today with the help of my apple here. I'm going to go all the way through from the beginning to the end of the chapter. So you've got to pray for me that I do that in 25 minutes. But we're going to start with the end of the chapter and then we're going to go to the beginning of the chapter. Then I'm going to teach you the middle of the chapter. and We're going to end at the end of the chapter and then you're going to understand Philippians chapter 3. You've got that? Okay, here we go. So here's the end of the chapter. Okay, last two verses, Philippians chapter 3. For our citizenship is in heaven, okay? Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven from which we all eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So Paul ends Philippians chapter three with these words. He says, we are citizens in uh, our citizenship is in heaven. What does it mean to have a citizenship? It means that even though you are traveling to another country, you've got a citizenship. Jane and I understand that, right? We're, we've got a citizenship somewhere, but you, you travel somewhere. I, I long for the day that I could say that I have a citizenship and not just a permanent residence here. It's going to mean something to be able to say that the place the Lord has sent me to, I am a citizen here now. So, so I'm not just a, a Initially, I was an alien. I'm grateful that I'm no longer an alien. I now get to be a permanent resident. But one day, I pray I'll be able to be a citizen. It's a whole nother level, right? It means this, no matter where I go, my citizenship is in the USA, right? It says something. Now, Paul writes and he says, no, no, we've got a citizenship where you've got a citizenship in heaven, which means you're only traveling here. You're only visiting here. Your citizenship is in heaven. When he, when he speaks to the word heaven here in the original Greek, he's using the word oranos. And oranos comes from the word oros, which is essentially means to be elevated. And oranos means the, the heavens or the sky or that which is above, right? It's interesting that the Bible actually refers to three different heavens. You'll, you'll note in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, that Paul refers to it as he's been to the, th he knows a man that's been to the third heaven. Have you ever heard of the third heaven? Anybody else confused about the third heaven? So the Bible speaks in 2 Corinthians about the third heaven. So if there's three heavens, what's the first heaven, the second heaven, and, and how's there a third heaven? It's not as complicated as you think. In, in biblical times, they didn't know quite as much about, you know, the, the planets and the, 
and the way the world was constructed as we do. So they saw three heavens. They saw there's a heaven, which is the air around us, was heaven number one. It was the sky, that's blue, that's heaven number one. Heaven number two was at night that there was something beyond the blue, right? So they didn't quite know what it was, and I'm sure people had theories, but there was a heaven which was beyond that, Heaven one was the sky. Heaven two was beyond the atmosphere. And then there was heaven three, which was the third heaven, which was where God resided. So it was the heaven that was above the heaven that was above the heaven that was above the heaven or the third heaven, which was beyond everything else. There's this place where God resides. And if you look at the root word, it says the heaven above the heaven above the heaven. That's the heaven. So Paul says, your citizenship is out of this world, out of this world, out of this world. Remember, we can go into the sky. They couldn't fly. We, we, we know what it's like to get in a plane and look at the, the earth from up in the first heavens, which is the sky. Some people even know what it's like to be in the second heavens and look back at this little, this little thing called earth, this little ball in the sky called earth. But Paul says, no, it's not even that. It's, there's a third heaven and your citizenship, your residency. Your place of connection is in this third heaven, this place where God resides. What does it mean to have a citizenship in the third heaven? Well, it means that we have got an elevated citizenship. We've got a transcendent citizenship. We, 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 we're not phased by the little things because our anchor is beyond this world. We're, we're anchored. We, we, we find ourselves in a higher place. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, Paul writes this. He says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Set your mind on, um, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Set your mind according to your citizenship. And I think that's the problem is sometimes we don't set our minds on what is beyond. Or we feel like we've got to, we've got to work our way to that. Now, if you missed last week, um, we spoke about this transcendent identity that we have from, from Philippians chapter 2. And as part of that message on, on humility, we spoke about the elevator versus the stairs, right? It's a long story. I was in a hotel in New York City on like the 50-something floor, and, you know, the, the problem was if I had to climb those stairs, I would never get there, okay? Some of you would get there. I, I, I know, Jordan, you'd make it, okay? Me, not that much, okay? I might make it halfway, and then I'd have to rest for a day, okay? Um, but, but the reality is if you had to climb 54 or 56 floors of steps, some of us will never get to the top. But we can all get in the elevator and make it to the top. Religion makes a way to God like a staircase. You've got to jump through these hoops, do these things, and then you can connect with God. Christianity is not a religion. It, it's not our way to God. It's God's way to us, which is Jesus Christ, which is the elevator that takes us to the top to connect us with God, not of our own strength and ability. And that's what Paul's saying here. He says, listen, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to make it happen. You don't have to work for it. You just get it. It's the difference between my American citizenship and your American citizenship. You didn't work for it. You were born with it. You just arrived and you had it. Okay, some of us has to fill in a gazillion forms, okay, and live here for a bunch of years. Okay, so I'm climbing the stairs. You took the elevator. Paul says we all took the, we can all take the elevator. We can all live with a heavenly reality. We can live from another perspective. We don't have to work to be righteous in the eyes of God. Have you ever heard that word righteousness? We have the righteousness of God. Have you read that? Uh, we, we miss the fullness of that. That's God saying, no matter what you've done, no matter how wrong your life has been or is at the moment, in Christ, your life is hidden with God in Christ. And cr when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ upon you. That's how God sees you. He sees you as a citizen of heaven. But we live in a world that says what goes up must come down. We live in a world that says, you know what? You can be holy on a Sunday, but come Monday morning, Monday morning, your life's going to be in ruins again. You can experience God for a little bit in worship and feel like holy, holy is the Lord. Everything's different. But you know what? Open your news app and you'll come right back down again. We live in a world that says what goes up must come down. Whereas Paul says, now hold on a little. 
you've got a citizenship. You've got a space. You've got a position from which you can live your life. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, he meant that it is finished. It is done. We don't have to live in an up and down world. What goes up doesn't necessarily have to come down. Lately, billionaires have been playing this game called Who Can Get to Space First? I don't know if you've been following this, but um, the, the three different billionaires, Sir Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk, these three, three guys that you've got on the screen here, they, they've been playing this game, right? They've been trying to, to make their way to be the first guy to, to, to get to heaven, right? To, to get to space, at least. The second heaven, second heaven. Not the third heaven, second heaven. They've been making their way. They've got different, different spaceships that they use, different strategies. You know, the one spaceship, they kind of hang on, a, on, a, on another plane, and then it goes from the plane, and it goes to the skies. The, the, the other spaceship, uh, you know, works in one way, and this guy's got that strategy. They've got their different plans, their different ways of making their way to space. Um, but the reality is that they've all gone to different heights, right? So if you, if you look at how far they've actually gone up, if you look at how far they've traveled, you'll see that two of them have, one has gone not that far. The second guy said, listen, let me up you a little bit. And that was Jeff Bezos that just went recently. He said, listen, I'm going to go higher. And he went to what is called the edge of space. And then, um, you know, the one is British, the other one's American. And the third guy, which might be South African born, he's really going to space, okay? <laughs> so he's not going to the edge of space or really, really high. This guy's going all the way to space, okay? So he's going to go the whole way. He's going to make his way to space. Okay, and he's actually going to leave Earth's orbit. Okay, so this whole thing even had them challenging this idea of what an astronaut is. I don't know if you heard about the whole thing because they changed the definition because, you know, not that I want to pick on any billionaires today. They might be watching and we might suddenly go offline and that would be terrible. <laughs> but the reality is that one of these billionaires was calling himself an astronaut. And then when he was calling himself an astronaut, they changed the definition of an astronaut to say, no, 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 you've got to go a little higher in order to be an astronaut. Because in order to really be an astronaut, to leave the orbit of the Earth, you've got to go at, at a speed that is quick enough to... So, so have you ever wondered how satellites work or how the space station stays up there? No, just me. Okay, so I've wondered about this. So I did some research about this. And basically, it comes down to this, right? There's a transfugal force, or basically when you spin something, it, it, it wants to pull away from you, okay? Have you ever, ever tried that, right? When you spin something, it wants to go away, and then there's the force of gravity, okay? So, so this thing flies around the earth at a speed that is so quick that it's pulled away at the same strength as the earth is pulling it closer, and then it stays in orbit, okay? So I, I know you've wondered about this all along, and that's why you came to church today, to know that, okay? But the speed is 17,500 miles per hour. So if you look at the International Space Station, that is the speed at which the International Space Station is traveling around the world right now, okay? 17,500 miles per hour, and you thought your husband was speeding, right? Okay, so, so, so he, he, that, that's the speed at which the International Space Station has to travel in order for the, for the, the force that pulls it away and the force that pulls it to the Earth to be leveled out so that this thing can stay in orbit. The problem is that for most of the billionaires, what goes up must come down, and they go up and they experience a little bit of weightlessness right at the top there, but then they come back down. Whereas one particular astronaut, one born in South Africa, is going to go up, and he's actually going to stay in orbit because he's going to reach 17,500 miles per hour going around the earth and canceling out gravity, he's going to actually be in a space in space where he could stay indefinitely if he wanted to because what goes up doesn't necessarily come back down. I'm thinking that they need to change the name Christian because I think there's too many so-called Christians that's playing a game of going up and coming back down, going up and coming back down, but never actually leaving orbit, never actually changing their citizenship from a citizenship on earth to a citizenship in heaven. See, because we're 
playing this Christian game. We're jumping through the Christian hoops. We're every now and then taking a little trip to have a little experience with God, but we're not really dwelling there. We're not really changing our perspective. You know what? When we're, when we're sometimes in our lives, we do the Christian thing because that's a nice thing to do. But for so much of our lives, we don't think like Christians. We don't talk like Christians. We worry like everybody else. We're as anxious as everybody else. We're, we're as worldly as everybody else. And we're trusting in the same things, worried about the same things, trying to gather the same toys and doing all the same things. So there's no difference between us and those who dwell with nothing but this world. And I'm wondering if the same argument about what qualifies you for being an astronaut isn't a good qualification for us to consider for a moment. Have we relocated our citizenship or have we just taken up a name, a religion, an exercise? But in actual fact, we haven't changed the way we live. We haven't changed what we live for. See, if you continue to read in Philippians chapter 3, Paul's problem in Philippians chapter 3 is with people that went up and came back down. He starts off in verse 1 of chapter 3, and he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worships God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. He's a little upset with some people. I don't know if you've noticed, okay? It's the people of the mutilation, okay? And I'm not going to explain this, but it's people that went around and said that, you know, Christ isn't enough. The elevator doesn't work. Use the stairs. You've got to be circumcised, okay? And unlike Joe, I'm not brave enough to explain that to you. So if you have any questions about circumcision, apparently Joe is happy to explain that to you. But here's the point. They were trying to put some strength, some trust back in your own flesh. So what Paul's saying is there's some people that went up, they experienced Jesus, but they came back down and said, okay, now we've got to build the, now we've got to take the stairs. Now we've got to try again. Now you've got to do it in the flesh again. He he goes on and right, right before the verses I read to you at the beginning, verse 18 and 19, he continues with the same thing. He, He says this, he says, for many walk, verse 18, Um, For many walk of whom I have told you often and just earlier in the chapter and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. They went up and they came back down. They had a Jesus experience, and now they're back busy with the human experience, with the earthly experience, with the earthly perspective. He's basically saying this. He says, listen, there's those who, who they experience something, but then they tell you, listen, just, just, just don't be too radical about this Jesus thing, okay? Just don't, just don't totally be, just don't take it too far, you know? Just, just keep Keep the Jesus thing for Sundays, but for the rest of your life, just do whatever you like, okay? Or, or, or don't, be so, don't be so taken up with all those Christian things, right? There's still some logic that, that's got to be applied. And, and please don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything that I'm not saying. All I'm saying is we can't be too radical for God. We, we can't be too sold out. We can't, be, we can't be too convinced that he is who he says he is and he's going to do what he says he's going to do. We can't be too in love with Jesus, too committed to his cause, too sold out for it. There's no such thing. Now, when you are totally sold out to him, yes, he would still provide and look after you. And, and, and does he use medical signs? Yes, he does. I'm not saying any of those things are wrong, but it starts with being totally sold out. And I think we need to stop negotiating with to what level we are committed to God. I, I believe there's a challenge from God saying that we need to, we can, we can live the up and down life. Now I'm a Christian. Now I'm not really. Now I'm a Christian again. Now I'm not really. But I want to tell you that that life doesn't bear the fruit that God has in mind for us. It just doesn't. It has us up and down and this way and that way, and I'm sort of a Christian, and, but I'm actually not. And in some places, I'm really Christian. Some days of the week, I'm totally committed, 
But then there's these other days. Now, I don't know about you, but Paul doesn't seem to enjoy people who do that very much. I mean, he's called them dogs. He said the little God is the, their belly is their God. You know, I mean, not that excited. But what if there's a way for you to go up and not come down? And I think Philippians chapter 3 actually holds the key to you living in that way, for you living in orbit, for you understanding what it means when your citizenship is in heaven. What if we could go up and not come back down? What if we could change our minds? What if we could live from that perspective? What if you were able to live a life where who you were in God didn't just, wasn't a part of your life, it was all of your life? And don't hear me wrong, I I know we're not all called to be missionaries in a foreign country. We're not all called to be in so-called full-time ministry. But we can all live a a life where everything we do belongs to God. We don't have to negotiate with, with this or that. Either God has called you to do what you're doing or don't do it. It's as simple as that. And whatever that thing is that God has called you to do, that's what you want to give your life to. But you want to give your life to it. And I think sometimes we've lowered the bar. I've been fascinated whenever I've traveled to a country where people get persecuted for their faith. I've been fascinated how the definition of what it means to be Christian is something completely different. You don't find something like lukewarm Christians in those countries. Because lukewarm Christians won't die for their faith. But what you do find is you find people that are doing incredible jobs, whatever it is that they're called to do, but they're doing everything they're doing for God because their lives are completely surrendered to Him. How do we go up and not come back down? Well, that's what Philippians 3 is all about. And I haven't read the bulk of the chapter to you. I've I've read the beginning and I've read the end, but I haven't read the substance here. The substance is going to tell you how to go up and not come back down. I've got good news and I've got bad news, okay? Okay. The good news is we can all go up and stay up. Unlike billionaires that are a very elite little group that's going to space. Actually, just one is really going to space, but we're not going into that at all today. But the, but the reality is that unlike them, we can all do it. But just like them, I want to tell you that the price is high. The, the price for a ticket to space right now, $55 million dollars. Right? Okay, so if you're wondering what to do for your next vacation, I've just answered the question for you. It's a pleasure. Don't worry about it. Happy to help. Happy to help. But here's the thing. This is far more expensive than that. Philippians chapter 3, from verse 3. See if you can spot it. For we are the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Philippians 3 verse 3. We worship God in, in the spirit. Rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. We have no confidence in the elevator. Though I also, verse 4, might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm also. Okay, so Paul essentially says, listen, if you want to talk pedigree, I've got pedigree. If you want to talk climbing the elevator to the top, I've climbed the elevator some. Right, verse 5 circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, okay? So, so basically he's saying, listen, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm the stock of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee, the highest you could go in the law. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the cross of Jesus Christ. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. No one could point a finger at me. I had every, I've jumped through all the hoops. I climbed all the stairs you could think of. I tried all those things. But then he goes on in verse seven and he says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by 
faith. Do you see him taking the elevator? He says, I used to take the stairs. I was pretty good at taking the stairs. But look at me now. I'm in the elevator of the righteousness of Christ. I've, in, through faith in Jesus Christ, I've changed my citizenship, verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, verse 11, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Gravity is a factor. Can you see it in what Paul's writing here? I just love this because I read the previous bit. Oh, all these things has been wonderful. I've got this whole pedigree, but now I count all things as lost for the power of Jesus. And I'm now in Jesus and I'm a citizen of heaven. And now everything is wonderful and beautiful and I never get pulled back to earth. No, that's not what he says. He says, but I press on. Why? Because if that space station that's circling around the earth at 17,500 miles per hour, if it were to slow down, to 17,499 miles per hour, do you know what would start to happen to the space station? It would start crashing back to earth. So it's got to press on. We've got to press on. We've got to keep fighting gravity because I want to tell you this world and the things of this world will keep on pulling you back into it, but press on. Your citizenship is not from around here. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Remember where your citizenship lies. Press on. But I press on, he says in verse 12. He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. There was a moment when each of these guys that went to space or almost went to space had to decide to light the rocket ship and leave it all behind. There was a moment where they had to make that call and say, I'm going to do this. And I think in the same way, we've got to find that moment in our lives where we need to make a decision. And so I'm no longer going to negotiate this. I'm going to light this thing and I'm going to go. Verse 14, I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Can I just clarify one thing today? There is no such thing of some of us being called to be sold out for God and others of us getting to live lukewarm, mediocre lives. There's an upward call of God in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus came to call you to live a life that belongs to Him. You have not been called to live an up and down life. We have been called to have a citizenship in heaven, to have a citizenship beyond this world. There's an upward call of God in Christ Jesus, verse 15, Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, um, in verse 15, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind, brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you, uh, um, as you have as for a pattern. There's an upward call of God calling us to orbit. Orbit, right? There's an upward call of God calling us to live in the fullness of what God has for us. But right now, many of us find ourselves in the space of negotiation. It's interesting if you uh, go study about these, uh, these astronauts going into space, they... Um, the, the, they, they, were, they were trying to, they were trying to, to insure themselves. And, and Jeff Bezos tried to get life insurance for his trip to space. Guess what? Nobody was willing to insure that, right? He couldn't find an insurer willing to insure him to go to space because it was a little too risky for the richest man in the world to put himself on a rocket and go to space. Well, I want to tell you, we might be a little too risky 
we might be in a space where we, we also are negotiating with what we're doing. We're negotiating our, our lives away. We're negotiating whether or not we're willing to make this call to risk it all and go with what God has in mind for us. May we not negotiate. May we not be in a space where we are negotiating with God, negotiating with what He's able to do, negotiating with the life He has in mind for us. May the negotiation stop today. May this be the end of your negotiations with God. May this be the end of your negotiating with God, whether or not you will give it all up. May this be the end of you living a life of compromise, one day up and the next day down. May this be the end of your citizenship on earth. May this be the day that you renounce your dual citizenship and you take on a single citizenship, which is a citizenship in heaven. One day I will have to make a choice whether I will continue a dual citizenship or I will renounce the one citizenship for another citizenship. Now, let's not get into the politics of all that, but let's get into this. With regards to your citizenship in heaven, I want to tell you that dual citizenship doesn't work. You're either a citizen of this earth or you're a citizen of heaven. And you've got to make up your mind when it comes to your finances and your career and your time and the way you live your life and what you worry about and what you don't worry about and what keeps you up at night and what doesn't keep you up at night. And I'm not saying it'll be easy, but I'm saying you've got to decide which citizenship you're going to hold. Are you going to live a life that is continually up and down? Or are you going to light that rocket and go where no man has gone before? Robert, well, let me read you this first. The, the Philippians 3 verse 89 in the NIV in the New International Version says, the same verse I read before, it says, but what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. The surpassing worth. Is it surpassingly valuable for you what God has for you? Or are you still putting things on the scale and weighing up if it's really worth it? Have you passed that point of no return? Or are you still considering, negotiating away? Robert Thompson, the famous theologian in our midst, our own Robert Thompson, wrote to me in, a, in an email this week about this verse. And he said this, he says, when discovered and gained by faith, life in Christ and in His heavenly kingdom transcends in value, meaning, durability, anything and everything we are, we have, we do, or we experience. Wow. That's it right there. Do you believe that? Is that how we structure our lives? And our thinking, and our decisions? Or is that a little line for a Sunday morning that we put in the journal and close until next week? Us, for our citizenship, verse 20, we're back where we began. Philippians 3 verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting from which we wait, that place, that new citizenship, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. I was worried as I was preparing my message that I would talk some of you back onto the stairs. I was worried that all this talk of stopping the negotiations and, and kind of giving up on the up and down life would have some of you go back into works. How am I going to do this? And, and, and I am not able to, to give up this or I'm not able to give up that or, or, or letting go of this is just too difficult for me or, or stopping to live this way is too hard for me. I, 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 I still need to negotiate with this and I can't do this. And I was worried that you would end back up in the stairs trying to make your way to heaven at the end of this message. 
But then I read this and I realized there's no way Paul's going to leave us on the stairs because he ends the chapter with these words. He says, according, verse 21, he says, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Do you believe that he is able to get you where you can't get yourself? Do you believe that he is able to subdue all things unto himself? He is able to take you to a life that isn't up and down in this way and that way. He is able to, if you are willing to surrender, he is able. And we actually end today's message with a communion moment. And I don't know if you want to see if you can find this little cup with a wafer on top. Inside of it is a liquid which is not juice nor wine. I apologize for the taste of it. But the symbol thereof is incredible. And if you're at home online, I, I see a lot of you guys are. It's great seeing you guys there. We've got people from different spaces around the world and at least three states that I can count participating. It's great having you guys online. If you can find something to take communion with us. I, I want to remind you where Oscar started us off at the welcome, right? Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus making the decision. But it's actually a couple of moments before that, right? Just a, the same night that Jesus was praying, that same night, a little earlier, we find in John chapter 13, it says, Jesus, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, right? So essentially, Jesus, knowing that God has made him able to put all things under him, God has made him able to elevate us all into this heavenly, um, this heaven, heavenly citizenship. When Jesus realized that, he took a towel and he started going around. And the next thing he did after this verse, when Jesus knew he was over all, he started washing his disciples' feet. And I guess that's the bottom line question today, is will you allow Jesus to serve you in changing your citizenship today? It's not whether or not you feel like you're able. It's whether or not you're willing to accept His ability to do just that. Do you guys remember Peter? Oh, Lord, not my feet. And I think sometimes we're exactly there. We're going, oh, God, I'll, I'll make my own way. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll give this up when I'm ready. But I'm, I'm challenging you today to give God a chance to stop the negotiations and to say, Lord, what you did on the cross when you said it was finished, I believe it to be enough. That's what we do when we take communion. Is we're saying, Lord, this bo His body was broken for me. His blood was spilled for me. I get to live as a citizen of heaven. And I want to encourage you today, as you partake of these sacraments, as you partake of these symbols, it may not just be something you've done a thousand times before, but may it be a moment of surrender. A moment of commitment, a decision to stop negotiating with an up and down life and to change your citizenship to heaven. Lord, we partake of this as a symbol of your body that was broken for us as we eat this bread together now as a congregation both here and virtually. And Lord, we partake of this as a symbol of your blood that washed us clean, though we were red as scarlet. We are now washed as clean as snow. Lord, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is his blood that is spilled for us. Lord, I declare that today is the end of the negotiation. I belong to you. Lord, everything that I own, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, every 
relationship that I have, Lord God, every opportunity that I engage with every person, Lord God, every place that you have sent me to, all of me belongs to you. Lord, will you strengthen me to press on, God, to keep my pace, not to be pulled down by the gravity of this world, but, Lord, to stay where my citizenship is in heaven. Lord, would you remind me over and over and over again this week that I am yours. And, Lord, may I live my life accordingly. Lord, I thank you that today with a symbol, we don't just celebrate what Christ has done 2,000 years ago. We get to celebrate what Christ is doing right now in our lives as it becomes the end of the era of the up and down. And we start a time of total and complete commitment. Lord, take all of me. You are able to take me from where I am to where you have in mind for me to be. In Jesus' name.